Hello. Hey, everyone. I'm Kristen Baldwin from Yahoo, and I am very happy to be here with the lovely and talented Deborah Messing. Hello. So happy to be here. So let's start sort of at the, at the advent of this reboot. You played Grace Adler for eight seasons. It was a huge success, and it was a huge part of your career. But then years and years later, what was your first reaction when NBC approached you about possibly bringing the show back? Uh, I was stunned, obviously. I mean, it was 11 years later. Um, this year, will this after January, it will be 20 years since we shot the pilot. So that's just kind of, you just to wrap your head around that. Um, you know, we had come together to do this, this little election video for Hillary Clinton. And we, when we came together, we all thought, oh my God, what, what a miracle. We get to play with each other one last time, 11 years later. And uh, little did we know that, you know, you, the YouTube video would get 7 million views. And then, of course, NBC was like, wait a second. <laughs> Maybe we should bring them back. And, you know, so we had heard murmurings of, oh, my God, wouldn't that be amazing? Would that be amazing? And we're all like, we can't do that. We can't do that. So when they, they came to us, we, we all sat down and we're like, this is really happening. What do we think? And the... The commitment and the intention was to do 10 episodes and to do just like Gilmore Girls, like to do a one time special 10 episodes. And um, so we all wrapped our minds around that and that felt right. And then we sat and did our very first table read in front of all the writers and the network. And we were all laughing so hard that that night the president of the network picked it up for more episodes and next year. <laughs> and thank you, but we were completely freaked out. We were like, we haven't even acted together. Like in 11 years, all we did was read it out loud. Are you sure? Are we sure? Can we really, you know, shouldn't we wait and see? It's all right, it's all right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, um, and now here we are. And yeah. it's, you know, you are so identified with the Grace Adler character. You know, she's somebody that people really love and relate to. And as a performer, what are sort of the blessings and the challenges of being so identified with, you know, a specific character, even though, you know, you've played many roles in your career? Well, I mean, we're all actors here, right? And, and so none of us become actors because we want to play one character for a decade. You know, we become actors because we want to transform constantly and tells different stories all the time. So, um, you know, it's an incredible privilege, obviously, to play Grace for eight years plus. And um, I love her, and I'm proud to be a part of the show. Um, but we stopped the show, we chose to, to stop after eight years because we realized, you know, we've done everything we, we can with these characters and with the storytelling right now. And we need to go and challenge ourselves creatively in a different way, in a different medium. And so that's one of the challenges is, is coming to terms with the fact that you are going to be one character and, you know, for, for a very, very long time. The positive side of that is, you know, when when people love that character, it's it's really pretty beautiful, you know, because you hear it, and and that is something that uh, is is not something that you expect when you're an actor, especially if you come from the theater, you know. Um, and I guess the other thing is is really just, you know, it's a cliche, but but just anonymity and privacy. Um, you know, I'm, 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 when I go out for, for business and stuff, I am so excited to see fans and talk to them and take pictures and do all of that. Um, but when I'm with my son, it's sun time. And, um, and so that, that is a boundary that, that I have made and most people respect it. You know, if they ask me for, for a photograph, I'll say, you know what, I don't do that in front of my son. And most people respect it, but some people have really gotten very, very hostile with me, um, and and that's that's unfortunate. But you know, obviously, the good so far outweighs you know the challenges that come along with it. 
And after Will and Grace wrapped the first time, you went on to play a lot of other notable roles from Smash to The Starter Wife and Mysteries of Laura and other roles. And how did those experiences sort of inform and help your performance as Grace when you came back to her the second time? Oh, gosh. It was, it, you know, I loved everything that I I did after Will and Grace. You know, each thing, you know, The Starter Wife was a single camera comedy. I'd never done it before. You know, that was really exciting and challenging. And Smash obviously was something that had never been tried on primetime television before. And I'm a Broadway baby. So, you know, the idea of bringing the theater to, you know, Kansas, you know, I mean... I mean, even the, even people who live in New York can't afford to go to Broadway. So, <laughs> right? So, you know, to be able to put it on TV for free, it was it just felt like the most amazing thing to be able to be a part of. And um, and then Mysteries of Laura was, you know, I was a co- I was a cop. You know, it was like whoever saw that coming. Um, <laughs> you know, and and each thing challenged me in a different way. And. Um, you know, but I think more importantly is that it's 11 years later and Deborah is 11 years older. Um, it's really not so much about what I've done in between. It's really about the person that I've become. And of course, within that are the experiences that you have as, as a person. But um, that was my fear. I, was, I would say it took me about three episodes in to really start to exhale this time around because I felt like, who is Grace now? And, you know, I knew that people had expectations. It's like, okay, if you're going to come back, you got to be funny, you know, but we also have to, you know, we, we, we can't pretend that we're 30 anymore. Um, and, and I think that what, what I, what I feel proud about and grateful for is that, you know, the writers reached out to each one of us and said, you know, is there anything that is really important for you to incorporate into the character 11 years later. And being asked that question was really, really great. And I just said, I want her to be a feminist. I want her to, you know, be a successful businesswoman who is totally excited and and fulfilled by that life and all of her friends and her family. And, you know, her, her marriage fell apart and that was something she didn't want to happen, but it happens. And she's really okay with her life the way it is right now. And I thought it was really important to put that out there because the grace we all knew 15 years ago was constantly looking for that partner. Who is going to be that man? You know, and, and uh, I, wanted, I wanted there to be a shift and I wanted there to be maturity with that. Um, and I, I think that each one of us has matured. Like, like for me, that, that scene with Sean when he talks about what it's like being a gay child and growing up into being a gay man, that Jack could never have said that monologue 15 years ago, right? I mean, you know, if, it, if he did, it would not land and resonate the way it does so beautifully now. And I think that that is really a testament to the writers. The writers are, are very aware and protective of these characters and saying, okay, we are, we are, now, we are now living in 2017 and let's, let's really live there. And uh, from the process of making a show, a network TV show, sitcom, how has that changed, you know, going back to sort of the same sets, the same network, like it must be different though. Is the, is the pace different or how does it feel from a process standpoint? Oh my God, it's exactly the same. <laughs> and I'm 11 years older. So um, it is, it literally, the thing that I think it really just less, left us speechless was the first time we got in front of the, the studio audience. It was the same warm up comic from 20 years ago the same music that we had the, the audience dance to. I mean, it was literally, it felt like no time had passed. And so part of, you know, that's an amazing feeling. Um, but it, 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 the, four com- the four camera comedy is a relic. You know, there are only a hand, handful left. And um, I love four, four camera comedy. I love it. 
And so, you know, the, the speed with which you need to work, because they're constantly rewriting your lines, you know? I mean, when I, when I watch it on television, 25% of the lines that I see on, on camera um, are new lines that they have written right then on the spot and said, cut this, cut that, cause, okay, this is your new joke, this is your new joke, this is your new joke, go. So it's literally like, you know, improv in that way. It's like, you've just got to be open, you've got to be fearless, and you've just got to do it. And you've got to be ready to fail and to be okay with that because that's the only way that anything good's going to come out of anything. And so that process is the thing that I love the most because a single camera comedy feels like you're doing a movie, you know? And so you'll work on two pages of a scene for 10 hours and you don't get, you know, that live, you know, the flow and doing a full scene all at once and doing it again and again and again. Um, but the one difference is uh, now, which we did, never did before, but I, apparently now it is the thing to do, to pre-tape, you know, a scene or two the day before you go in front of an audience. And we're all like, what, what are you talking about? This is live theater. We do this. I mean, that's why we're doing this, right? We're doing it so that we can do it in front of an audience. And, um, you know, now I understand the theory behind it because there are some scenes where there's like, a, you know, a blue screen behind it. You know, like we did a scene where I, I was out by a, a helicopter, you know, and it was taking off and they had to rig it for it to lift up. And, and to do that in front of an audience would take some time and you don't want to lose the audience. You want them to be like really just rearing for the next scene. And so that's why they do it. Um, and also to, to make the shoot night a little shorter because it's, it's a good five hours. Um, so that's, that's, the only, that's really the only thing that I notice. And the live studio audience, how is that uh, coming back to it after being on, you know, doing dramas for, for so many years? Heaven. Heaven. I mean, you know, I started in theater. It's my first love. There is nothing to me as electric or exciting or as, as uh, illuminating at, than as the dialogue that you have, the, the silent dialogue that you have with an audience when you're performing live. Because you, you all know. You, you, you know when a, when a joke lands. You know when, like, a dramatic moment that was supposed to sort of make everybody sort of get quiet. If that doesn't land, you feel it. And um, so it, it feels like it's, it's a living organism when you're in front of a live audience. And um, you know, the way, I, the way I describe it is that theater is an actor's medium, TV is a writer's medium, and film is a director's medium. Um, in theater, you're the one in charge out there. They can direct you, but then the director disappears. And then it's just you. And you, you can evolve and you can change and you are completely, you know, responsible for that character. And when you go on film, you, you know, the way they cut it together in the editing room, the way they direct it, you know, whatever image you might have in your head about, you know, the, the arc that you want to to create for a character, you have no control over it at all. Um, and so, you know, TV, it's really all about the words. So to be able to, to, to work with great writers, I've always, you know, I, I married a writer, I, I revere writers, you know, so to work with really brilliant writers and also have the autonomy to play in front of a live audience at the same time, to me, that's the best of all possible worlds. And, uh, you know, you mentioned the characters are all 11 years older, as are the, performer, the performers. And it's the show has done some funny uh, things already this season about mm -hmm. aging and mm -hmm. dealing with aging. Mm -hmm. And as somebody who works in an age-obsessed industry, yeah. uh, is it uh, empowering? Or do some of the jokes hit a little close to home? Or how, what is that like when you're dealing with those kinds of topics as a performer? Oh, you know, I, the thing I love about Will and Grace is that it's provocative. And, um, you know, it, it's built into the, to the DNA. It has nothing to do with the political climate now. It was always like that. We always, you know, would shine a light on 
the ills in our culture, in our politics, whatever. And the goal was always, we're going to make you laugh. And hopefully, while you're laughing, you're going to sort of think about what you're laughing at. And um, so my feeling is, let's do it. You know, I mean, I was like, when is Grace going to have a hot flash? <laughs> because you know that's going to be fucking funny. <laughs> right? I mean, I mean, because we don't do things little. Like, she will show up, like, shopping in, at Barney's, and she, her hair will dripping. She will be completely, like, dripping and be like, what is going on? You know, and so it's like we're all always trying to think about, okay, how can we make people laugh? And also talk about what's real in our lives, you know, and aging is in our lives. Um, you know, obviously, Will and Jack have always talked about, oh, you're fat, oh, you're, you know. Um, but I think it's, you know, Meg and I were talking about this. It's like, it's even more important for, for the female characters to, to be talking about it. Um, because we are so obsessed with youth and beauty and perfection and being a size zero. Um, and, uh, you know, I feel like it's, it's, it's a responsibility of ours to um, do what we can to, to make the people watching to be like, you know what, we, we know what world you're living in. You know what? And we're having the same issues that you're having. Yeah, it makes the characters as relatable as they are when they're dealing yes. with real things. And as you mentioned, you know, the show has always been very topical and not afraid to, you know, advocate for tolerance in all of its forms. Is that something that, you know, since you left the show and just in general, that you look for in any role that you are considering? You know, um, I have to say that, you know, it's it's... It's a big driving force of my life, you know, um, social justice, uh, advocacy. It's, it's something that I call my soul food. It's something that makes me feel like I'm part of humanity. And, um, you know, I th when the four of us sat down together and talked about coming back, you know, to be honest, we were like, okay, we have a legacy. You know, we, we planned at season six to end at season eight so that they had just enough time to like wrap it up in a way that we can sort of protect it and be proud of it. And it wouldn't just sort of whimper off and be like, oh, is that still on, you know? Um, and it was like, all right, why are we coming back? We can't just come back just because we want to do it again. There has to be a reason, you know? We have to have something to say. And we, and we all have to be on the same page that, that we are doing this for a reason. And you know, we decided collectively that, you know, the, the, the massive changes that are happening in our world, in our culture, um, are so scary that it, it, it feels more important than ever to come and to, and to have characters that have the dialogues that, um, that are tough, tough conversations to have. I wouldn't say that when I'm picking characters that I'm, I'm looking for characters that are, that are, you know, particularly are advocates. But, you know, then again, when I, when I read The Mysteries of Laura, um, the thing that I liked about it was how messy she was. You know, I loved that she was the best of the best in her field, that she was a badass and she was brilliant, but that you know, her, her, you know, she's doing the best she can at home and she's a single mom and she's got twins that are like monsters, <laughs> you know, and it's not like, oh, everything is perfect or she's only a cop, you know, it was like, no, nowadays, every woman I know who is a mother is a working mother. You know, I mean, it, that's in, in my sphere. I obviously there are there are women out there who have you know the the great good fortune to be able to not have to work. But in this economy, and this world, that there it's far, you know, and few. Um, so yes, that was a conversation when I read it, and I had a conversation with the executive producers. I was like, this is something that's important to me that we are constantly showing 
both sides of, you know, because as a, as a viewer, I'm not interested in watching any storytelling where the people are perfect, you know, or where the people don't have, have uh, challenges. I mean, that's what being alive is, is, is having challenges and, and trying to navigate through them and trying to come through the other side. And, and those are the stories that, that grab me, that challenge me, that inspire me, and um, give me hope. So uh, changing the subject a little bit to, we got to talk about Smash. It was dearly loved. Yeah. It was intensely hated. It was <laughs> uh, uh, widely discussed. Yeah. And it's still something that people talk about today. What was it like to be part of a show that was so polarizing in many ways? Um, I love that show so much, can I tell you? I mean... I mean, I had the best job in the world. I just had to sit at a table and listen to Megan Hilty and, you know, Kat McPhee and everyone else sing their faces off right in front of me for hours on end and, like, real Broadway dancers doing their thing. You know, it was, it was heaven. And, um, and I, I thought it was a, a brilliant concept because, you know, just like The Wizard of Oz, you know, in Peeking Behind the Curtain, Noth there's never been a TV show where the, you, you peek behind the curtain of a Broadway show. And I just thought, oh, that's brilliant. Um, and also to be able to, you know, to hire people from the Broadway community. And, you know, th these unbelievably talented people who when they're on stage, you know, a thousand people get to see them. You know, it's like, no, millions of people should see these talented people. You know, and, and to be able to, right? And to be able to do that on television, I felt really, um, I really felt proud to be a part of something that was, was showing the world these magnificent, you know, performers. Um, you know, in terms of people being detractors, I didn't care people hated my scarves. <laughs> I didn't care because I was the one that wanted them. It got a little overboard, I admit. Once she started putting two and three on at the same time, I started having questions. Um, you know, but it was like, she's from Brooklyn, she's a mom, she is, you know, I was like, I cannot be, you know, Carrie from Sex in the City. You can't dress me like that, you know. Um, even though that would have been so fun. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, I, I think that, now, in retrospect, if you, if you look at, you know, what's happening down in Alabama and, you know, it's like, of course, there were people who hated this show that, you know, celebrated the lives of artists, many of whom were in the LGBTQ community. I mean, duh. I mean, when we started, we were like, okay, this is going to be interesting. This is going to be a challenge. You know, can we can we create characters that are so beloved that people all over the country will watch? And that was the, you know, the goal when we started Will and Grace. We were like, all right, we're either going to be on for two episodes and that's it. Or we're going to figure out this solution, you know, this math problem and we'll be okay. And, um, you know, we weren't able to, to figure it out with Smash. You know, we had really great fan bases in urban centers. You know, but, but outside of cities, people were just like, you know what, I don't care about Broadway. I don't care about that privileged place, New York City. You know, um, even though uh, I personally think that the characters within it actually represented a lot of people, f you know, from all over the country. But, you know, we can't control anything. It was a sad day. But it still lives on in our hearts. Yeah. <laughs> Many of our hearts. Uh, so you didn't get to sing, I don't believe, on, on Smash, but one of the... Uh, one of the Yes, I did. Did you? <laughs> uh, you sang in the, the concert. Did you sing? You My didn't apologies. watch all the episodes. Oh, girl, I did, and I apologize. But uh, I'm on the album. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Busting you. Yes, no, I should not have I should not have been singing because I was the lyricist. 
But, you know, there is this, this one song that I did with Christian Borrell um, uh, about, about uh, infidelity. Um, but yes, no, but I, I, I made sure that Grace sang. And yeah, uh, there's an, a question from the audience. Uh, how did Grace's singing, and it's in quotes, <laughs> come about? <laughs> I take that. I take that because you know, really good singing's not funny, right? It's not funny. And that's uh, what this person says. It's hilarious. So, right. how did it come about on the show? Um, you know, when I sat down with Max and Dave, um, because I, I had said no to the show at first. Um, yeah, smart girl, right? Um, at the time in uh, NBC, uh, it was a time when there were a lot of uh, female-centered sitcoms. There was um, Suddenly Susan, there was Caroline in the City, and all of these shows, the, it was the, the supporting characters that got to be funny. And the main women were, you know, the, the center piece, but all the funny was around them. And I was like, I, don't, I, I wouldn't be happy doing that. And so when they came over with a bottle of vodka to try and convince me to do the show, um, we talked about it and I, and I said, you know, um, the way that I can service this show is I can bring physical comedy to it. Um, if you don't want that, if you just want someone who is a straight woman, there are m so many really brilliant, talented women out there who would love to do that. I'm telling you, I would not be happy, and in the long run, that would hurt your show. So I just want to be upfront about it. And they were like, okay. And I was like, so, you know, at every turn, I want to, you know, because he was like, well, we want to make you look beautiful. We want to put you in gorgeous clothes, you know. And I was like, well, you can do that. <laughs> you know, but I have to find the inner dork of grace in order to balance that out, because otherwise she's just a, a beautiful cosmopolitan woman who just happens to have gay friends. And, um, and so we talked about Camp Rama, we talked about, okay, what would make her dorky? And they, they wrote in her singing at some point, some sort of Broadway thing. And I just thought, how, what would make this the funniest? And so I, I became operatic. And it got a laugh. And like all of us know, because we flash back to when we were eight and we did something and it made people laugh and we're like, oh my God, I just made people laugh. I'm going to do that again. Yeah. So I was like, okay, you, you, need, you need to. And it's funny because when we came back, the first few episodes, there was no singing. And I went up to them and I was like, Grace has to sing. Grace has to sing. You can't, you, you have to bring that back. And so they did. And, they I, was, did. and I was like... And the physical comedy is so incredible on the show, especially this season, the, uh, the shower where you and Karen are trapped in the shower, and it's just incredible. Have you ever injured yourself doing one of these uh, scenes? I, 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 I'm crippled. <laughs> um, over the eight years, I, I, I've lost count. I sprained my neck, I sprained my shoulder, both hips, lower back, um, dislocate my jaw, um, like all, all from physical comedy. Wait, how did you dislocate your jaw? Um, well, I was, I was hit in the face, but then I, I, it was worse when, do you remember the episode when I see Harry Connick in Central Park and I run into the pole? <laughs> I was rehearsing and I got too excited to show the, ca the, the writers. I'm like, watch this, watch this, it's gonna be really funny. And it was a wall. And uh, my face hit the wall before my hands. Like the timing of it did not work out. And, um, and I, my whole neck was sprained and I couldn't move my neck. And that episode that we shot, I was on Vicodin and I was on like three different like narcotic pain killers and um, muscle relaxants. So I don't remember that episode at all. But it, without that, I couldn't move, I couldn't move my head. Um, so yes, I have hurt myself. And actually when we did that episode, I, I tore the fascia um, attached to my, pel my pelvis on the right side. Yeah. So I, you know, the, the physical therapist knows me very well. 
And, you know, that's the only thing that, that I miss from 20 years ago is, <laughs> is you know, I, I literally would throw myself anywhere for a laugh and was like, oh, I'll be fine, you know. Um, and now I can't do all of those things in the same way. So right. I, I find other ways to be physically comedic. But that's an interesting challenge, too, having to... Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so uh, this year has obviously been really pivotal uh, for exposing the prevalence of sexual harassment in all industries, including the entertainment industry, and you've been open about your own experiences. And I'm wondering what advice you might give young performers, male or female, as they're getting into this business about protecting themselves and how they can do that. Well, I, this is a watershed moment. And, you know, finally everyone is talking about it and people are finally listening. And, um, yes. And um, I know that, that we are not going to let this moment pass without there being real change that's going to come that will protect all of us. Um, but in the meantime, you know, I, I would say have a clear idea before you walk into a work environment of what proper behavior is and what the lines, that, what, what constitutes crossing a line. It could be someone just calling you sweetie. You know, a friend of mine at this point has been through so much that when she walks through the airport and she's doing her thing and, and the guy's like, sweetie, hey, hey, sweetie, pretty, pretty dress. Hi, sweetie. And, you know, she'll be like, I'm not your sweetie. I'm a client, you know, and that's her, you know, but she now knows the things that she will not tolerate anymore. You know, there are other people who are like, I'm a hugger. So I want to be able to be, you know, to hug my castmates and whomever. That's fine, too. But if there's ever anything that, that just literally in your body feels uncomfortable, note it, write it down, and say something. And it doesn't have to be hostile. It doesn't have to be something that is going to make you feel like I'm going to lose my job. You know, it could, it could, it, it, we have to be able to say things like, you know, I adore you. I love working with you. But when you do that, it makes me uncomfortable. So can you, can you please just not do something like that for me? I'd love it. Thanks. And it's over, you know? And if, and if it's continuing and, and things aren't happening, you just keep going up the ladder. Um, you know, for too long, if you said something, it was ignored. But I think now we're in a place where if you say anything, you know, people, are, businesses are realizing that there is going to be a hit to their bottom line if they don't listen. Um, so, so I think, you know, it, it, this is the best of times for us now. Yeah, that's great advice. Thank you. Um, so, you know, we were watching some the end of the episode and I could hear you laughing, you know, at your castmates. Everyone on the show is so funny. How, do you have tricks for not cracking up in a scene when you're not supposed to laugh? No. <laughs> That's the other great thing about live taping um, is you can go back. Um, you know, we try really, really hard to stay focused on, you know, all the things we learn in acting class. What do I want? What am I going for? Going for? What do I need right now? Um, but, you know, when Sean is like lifting up his shirt and showing, you know, and doing things with his nipple, it's a little, you know, it's a little hard not to laugh. Um, yeah, I have nothing. I got it. <laughs> so you just do it and move on. I, you, you do it, you hold on tight, you know, you, you know, and, and what now what we've learned over the, over the years is that, you know, if we're in a comic moment and it's really hitting and we feel it's like the, the musicality of the comedy is, is on track and all of a sudden we both start to like break you know, we'll, we will hold. And, you know, even if it means one of us has to, like, laugh for 20 seconds and then, like, get it back together again and then get back in and continue. Like, that's the, that's the best way to do it for, you know, for the editors. 
you know, because you don't want to, you don't want to throw away something that is, is so beautiful except for this little, this little break, you know. And finally, what, what would you say is the best advice you've ever gotten about acting? Study. Are you still, uh, do you still study with a teacher? <sighs> no, uh, not, not right now. Um, but I feel like, I mean, definitely this, you know, it's a craft. And for people who go out to LA and get discovered and who have never taken an acting class before, you know, that's, that's not the norm. You know, it's, it's people who, who just love the craft and go into class. And if you're not in a class and you have friends who are actors, you know, say, come on over. We're going to read, you know, The Cherry Orchard in my living room just to do it. You know what I mean? Just to feel like you are an artist because the problem is that we, are, we depend on other people to allow us to be artists, right? And we're artists all the time. We're artists, if, we're artists if we're waitressing. We're artists. It doesn't matter what we're doing. We're always an artist. So it's really about doing things that celebrate what you are and keeping, keeping yourself, you know, in it. And, you know, it's, it's, it's watching movies that have been, you know, lauded by the really, really, really smart critics and being like, okay, what, what, where is film now? You know, I, had to, I have to watch a lot of TV now because TV is a completely different place than when I was, I was there 20 years ago. You know, I mean, the, the, all the rules of what television is, they're, they're all new. And it's your job to constantly be watching and seeing. And if you can go to a play and you can get a student discount or if you can, you know, work and, and hand out programs because then you can watch the show for free. You know, there's always a way for you to be in the world that's going to feed you. And um, I believe this with all of my heart. Eventually, talent is acknowledged. It may take years, but it is always acknowledged eventually. And it's just a matter of, of having patience and feeling fulfilled while you're waiting to be, to get the acknowledgement that you deserve. I want to thank Deborah Messing for joining us today. It was great talking to her. Will and Grace airs Thursdays on NBC. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. This was so great. <laughs>